Welcome everyone. It is Tuesday, October the 29th, 2019. It is currently 5.47 p.m. Central Time. This is a live broadcast, a live broadcast for the Spreaker app, a live broadcast for the VBC66 app, and a live broadcast for anyone, anywhere who's hearing me live or anyone Anywhere who listens to a recording of this live broadcast, whoever you are, wherever you are, however you may be listening, whenever you may be listening, this is for you, okay? This is a live broadcast for you. Now, before we continue, I do have to check something. I am very curious about something. Yes, okay. All right, I was uh, just, I'm just uh, still working with the Spreaker app today, doing a lot of work with the Spreaker app today, just because I like to have a plan B. Now, if you've listened to any previous live recordings uh, recently or anything that I've talked about recently, you know that we're currently transitioning our current app, the VBC66 app, to a new platform. And that transition, that transferring of the app from one platform to another has not gone very well. It's been an absolute disaster. So I'm trying to have a plan B. If it everything goes bad, then will the Spreaker app work for people? And uh, I know it won't allow me to do all the things that I want to do. And it will greatly have to have to reshape my vision for what I want the app to accomplish. But... Uh, It is a good plan B if we need to, at least from what I have seen. If you listen to us, whether you're using the VBC66 app or not, I would challenge you to go ahead and take a few minutes, go to the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, do a search for Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, Spreaker. Download the app, do a search for VBC, You'll see us, Victory Baptist Church. And then once you download the app and open it to VBC, it'll say, um, I think it'll say VBC brought to you by Victory Baptist Church. Tap on Victory Baptist Church and then it will open up a screen that shows you all of our programs. The Socratic Circle, Hermeneutics 101, uh, uh, Theology Musing, uh, Theological Musings, um, Theology Central. I can't remember all of them. Now, how... We're still got to figure out how we're going to use these different programs and how we're going to shape all of that. There'll be some changes coming, but get the Spreaker app just so that you have it. You can test it out and you can tell me this is not working. Uh, This is garbage. Uh, That's this is a dumpster fire. And if you tell me that, then I know, okay, maybe not. But if most people are like, yeah, the Spreaker app's working pretty good and I can listen to you live even easier than I can on the VBC 66 app, we may have to just reconsider the whole thing and just go with the Spreaker app. I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to come up with uh, different ideas that will work. But I am not here to talk about that. No, we're going to turn our attention once again to discipleship in 2019. Now, we've started a little mini-series, and we have been looking at discipleship in 2019 by listening to some episodes of a podcast put together by Lifeway. In a Lifeway, they publish lots of discipleship material, Sunday school material, small group material, and there and that material is designed to help churches engage in the practice of discipling people and creating disciples. And they have done extensive research on discipleship and They've got, uh, well, they've got their own theories and ideas on how discipleship works and, 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 and how, you know, what has to take place, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things they came up with, in fact, I've got to go pull up that screen really quick. Um, I have, they have, they've put out a book. I think it's called Creating a Discipleship Pathway. Creating a Discipleship Pathway. And in this book, I've got to scroll down here. They give, I think it's eight signposts, eight signposts, uh, or the signposts of the discipleship path, pathway. That's the way they describe it. The, the signposts of the discipleship pathway. Let me read a little bit. This is chapter three in their book. Uh, the signposts of the discipleship pathway. This is how it reads. If you've ever been on a trail in the woods, you know the importance of signposts. There are markers placed along the path that help you know for certain that you're still on the right path. How far you've come and how far you have to go. The same thing is true for the discipleship pathway. 
Throughout the last decade, LifeWay Research has engaged in the largest research study of its kind around the subject of discipleship. This includes surveying 7,000 churches to discover the principles involved with congregations' health or congregational health. This uh, qualitative survey of experts in the field of discipleship included pastors, professors, church leaders from a variety of backgrounds. This also included 1,000 Protestant pastors in the United States to discover the type of discipleship ministries being used in churches and the satisfaction level they had with them. An additional 4,000 Protestants in North America were surveyed regarding their personal practice of discipleship. All this research led to eight areas of the Christian life that lead to spiritual health in a believer. These attributes of discipleship are the signposts along the discipleship pathway. In other words, these are the characteristics that ought to be present an increasing measure in the life of someone who is growing towards Christ's likeness. Here are those or these eight sign posts. All right. Now that's that to me is fascinating. Thousands of pastors talked they talked to, surveys done. All these churches, thousands and thousands of churches trying to figure out, wait, what works in discipleship? What what is a part of discipleship? How does this work? So the, the the whole thing is fascinating to me because I have struggled with this concept my whole Christian life. I've I I became a Christian, and as soon as I entered the church, I really had this vision that it was going to be filled with all of these people who had this passion and hunger for God, who was trying to grow spiritually every day. And I didn't understand everything yet about spiritual disciplines. I didn't understand anything about discipleship programs. I didn't understand anything about this. I do know that, um, I think it was five o'clock. I think it was five o'clock on Sunday evenings um, at my church in Tuscola, First Baptist Church. They had a I can't remember what it was called, discipleship something. And I remember, oh, you got a discipleship class. I didn't know what discipleship was, but they I knew it was, you know, supposedly to help you grow as a Christian. And I remember going and was like, oh, there's there's me. I think I I I if my memory cor- correct, there was me, maybe one other person there. And I'm like, wait, Sunday morning the place was packed. Everyone's so then I just assume, well, everyone is discipled. Everyone's discipled. I'm just one of the new ones, so I, I need it. Um, yeah, and then you start talking to Christians like, wait, you're already discipled. What? And and just I've just discovered that. The 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 people who this is what I've discovered. When you go to a church and you find people who seem really passionate, they're talking about scripture, they're reading scripture, they're studying scripture, they're reading Christian books, they're talking about it. In most cases, they're either A, men who are considering going into the ministry or are already taking, like they're in a Bible institute or a Bible college, or it's, it's a woman. <laughs> okay, that, that really is my, it's either a woman or it's men go, who are going into ministry. I, I've found very few men out who are not going into ministry or like, I'm passionate and hungry for the Word of God. But I found lots of women who like to talk about Scripture, study Scripture, listen to sermons, read sermons, read Christian books, talk about what they're reading, talk about what they're studying. And I'm like, wait, why? First, there should be, first of all, there, it should be definitely dominated by godly men because they're supposed to be leading their families. So that that's something wrong, but there's just something wrong. Where where is the disciples? Where, where where is discipleship? Why is it not happening? What can be done? Well, when I look at these eight signposts, in fact, as soon as I read the book and it's chapter three, and I, I knew what the first signpost was going to be. I knew, and as soon as I read, but I, I kept thinking, you know what? 2019, they have to realize this can't be a signpost anymore. They, they have to have given up. But still Christian and the Protestant world will not give up that the number one signpost is. I'm going to read it directly to you. That the number one signpost is. Give me a second. I got to go back down to chapter three in the book. 
The number one signpost is, drum roll please, the number one signpost, this is number one, engage with scripture. The number one signpost that a person is growing spiritually, the number one signpost that discipleship is actually occurring, the number one sign that you are on the pathway to discipleship is measured by your engagement with the scriptures. They quote 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Everyone knows it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you read it in another translation, they say, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want spiritual maturity, if you want to, to be thoroughly furnished for every good work, you need the Word of God. And the Word of God, it equips you, and it equips you, um, in, and I'll, I'll read it from the King James, um, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. But your engagement is cr critical. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. In fact, this is what they say. I'll, I'll just read it uh, how they have it here. Transformation can be recognized when our mind is sharpened by the Bible, our perspective is sharped, uh, sharpened by the Bible, and our actions are... Okay, I'm going to read this again. Um, Transformation can be recognized when our mind is sharpened by the Bible and our perspective is shaped by the Bible and our actions are directed by the Bible. All right, let me do that again. I hate that I messed that up. I, wa I want to stop the live broadcast and start over, but I can't. All right, let's go through this again. Transformation can be recognized. If you want to see transformation in your life, we talked about in my, one of my last live broadcasts on this subject, about Romans chapter 12, being transformed, the renewing of your mind. If you want that transformation to be truly recognized, it happens when our mind is sharpened by the Bible, our perspective is shaped by the Bible, and our actions are directed by the Bible. Our minds are sharpened, our perspective is shaped, and our actions are directed then transformation occurs. Then discipleship is happening. This is only the first signpost, but it is a big one. Now, there's a lot I could say about this, but I have to offer some thoughts here. Clearly, for transformation to occur, Clearly, for the Bible to be profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for the Bible to really have its impact, I don't think any... I know someone out there will argue, but there's no way it's going to have that impact by simply reading it. You've got to read it. You've got to interpret it. And you can't interpret it unless you study it. Because study require, helps you with the observation part. The, the, and once you study it, and which includes, which is primarily observational based. I'm getting ready to go into an entire study of hermeneutics here, but you've got to do the observation and you're going to have to spend some time writing, thinking, and applying. You got to do some writing because you're trying to interpret, you're doing cross-reference, you're looking up definitions of words, you're, you're, you're looking up all kinds of, of different things, and then you have to do some application. You have to do application. It's been said a million times, I'll say it again, interpretation without application equals abortion. You are aborting that truth from producing a transformation in your life, from producing a change. You can't just read. You got to think, study, interpret, and up, up, apply. You have to apply. And an application is not just going to happen in your mind. You got to write out a clear practical plan of what you're going to do to put it into practice. This is not happening in the lives of Christians. And whenever you tell people they need to do it, I've seen it. It's usually men. I can't speak for every church, but it's usually men will just look at you like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get a notebook. I'm not going to write anything down. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. 
And I'm like, so, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're not going to spend any time with the scriptures in a meaningful way. And when you get that view like they're not, you just have to begin to ask yourself, what is going on? How do you get people to do it? How do you get people to engage? So that, you know, all kinds of ideas have been come up in the church. You've got the small group idea. You got the small group idea, but the small group idea usually works well. Here's your Bible study guide. You're going to go study that Bible study guide at home. You're going to write some things down and you're going to show up ready to discuss it. Well, we know over and over and over that doesn't usually work or the small groups just turn into a time of gossip and complaining about the church or trying to overthrow the pastor. Who knows what happens? Um, or and, and or you, you have all kinds of discipleship material. Churches spend hundreds of thousands of dollars buying material to put into people's hands. And then you and then you look at that material, you know, if they leave it in the pew, you'll go look through it and you'll be like, oh, they haven't written one thing in this thing. They haven't marked one thing. They haven't highlighted one. And you're like, I wonder if they've even touched it. Well, it's been sitting in the pew for four weeks, so clearly they're not using it. And then you'll find out, oh, no, not going to use it. Not going to use it at home. Okay. And, and, then, and then you'll get the, you know, the get out a free gel card. I'm too busy. Da-da! I'm too busy. So discipleship is not required. Ding, ding, ding. I'm, I'm set. Jesus calls me to be a disciple. He calls me to be a follower. The church is supposed to, their mission is supposed to be make disciples. But I'm telling you, I'm too busy for that. And, 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 and they feel that, that, that then they're justified. So here's the question. What can the church do in 2019 to create a situation that would help Christians actually engage in Scripture on a daily basis? What could be done? What could be could a could a podcast accomplish that? I've done daily devotional type podcast before. Now, sometimes my, my thoughts go too, you know, too long and people don't have enough time, but could, would people actually listen to a day? But again, even if you listen to me doing, because here's how I would do a daily devotional. I would do a daily devotional by opening up the scriptures and then asking questions, trying to get you to open up that Bible and dig in because I don't think discipleship happens by you simply listening. I think discipleship happens when you dig into the scripture, try to find answers in the scripture, try to interpret it yourself. You have to apply it to yourself and then discuss it with other people. I think that's how it, I don't think even, even just doing a recording doesn't work. I'm more than willing to record to try to get people involved. And I've tried. I remember back on, when I was on Sermon Audio, I did the news and focus program. News and Focus program, I'd get, you know, 29,000 downloads, 30,000 downloads. I do a daily, I tried this thing called Daily Manna, where I was going to do something with scripture on a daily basis. I wouldn't even get half those downloads. Sometimes it would even, I'm not even, I would get, I'd, I'd be less than a thousand. Oh, oh, but hey, something about Obama's in the news. Hit record, boom, boom, 30,000. Oh, oh, there was a UFO sighting. Ah, oh, 50. Oh, let's do something about a conspiracy theory. theory the Illuminati. Or the, you know, oh, oh, 900,000. You know, and it's kind of like, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I understand. I understand. You've been a Christian for a long time. Eh, someone talking about scripture seems boring. I understand that. You go through your ups and downs. I understand that. But if the number one signpost and, and these, are, these would be churches that you wouldn't even consider conservative. These are just probably your typical run-of-the-mill evangelical churches. And they still know we need people to be transformed. And transformation doesn't occur apart from the Bible. And, and please note, let me go back and read it one more time. The transformation involves the mind, the perspective, and the action. The mind the perspective and the action, how we think, how we see things, and how we do things. How we think, how we see, and how we act. It's the Word of God that changes our the way we think. It changes our perspective, and it changes how we act. It is supposed to, but the lack of transformation is evident in the church because 
Christian lives don't reflect major transformation. They reflect a lot of the brokenness that we see in the culture. I don't have an answer. I, there, there are so many materials out there to help people. I mean, I mean, a, a, as a pastor, I mean, I tried to put, a, you know, court, a, a, a little devotional guide that would take you ten minutes to read in the hands of people for for years, and you, we, you, you would just see, not really working. Then we moved to a Bible study guide. Okay, kind of working, still not. And it's like, what, what do you have to do? What do you have to, and I don't, and I think other churches face the same dilemma. When I was a a teenager at First Baptist Church, their Sunday school, they gave a a, a quarterly little Sunday school book out. I remember taking that home, reading that thing through, man, marking that thing up. I was ready to go. When it was time for Sunday school, I was ready to go. I was ready to tear that thing apart. And here's the sad part. The Sunday school teacher clearly hadn't even read that week's reading and in many cases, they were not even really that prepared. And everyone in the class clearly hadn't read it. I saw it. Churches in Nebraska, different Sunday school classrooms. Hey, we're going to go through this book. They give the book, boom, boom, boom. I'm right. I, and, and people are like, well, I didn't get to it. I didn't really read it. Didn't really have time this week. I'm like, okay, so nobody did. So why are we even studying this way? Why are, because everyone says the goal is that people need to spend time daily in God's word, the churches spend the money to get people to books, that no one uses them, and then everyone though convinces themselves that somehow we're doing something of value. I mean, this is not a new frustration for me. My church knows that they've heard me speak this frustration over and over. But if we're really going to talk about discipleship in 2019, whether it was 40 AD or whether it's 2019 AD, The same principle applies. We need God's word, God's truth. Now, yes, in 40 AD, they couldn't open their Bible. They had to rely on other ways. You know, they had to, especially as the church moved forward, they had to go to church and hear the word of God preached. And in many cases, they were meeting every single day to hear the word of God. So that tells you the early church, they were meeting every single day because they wanted to hear God's word every single day, right? So the early church knew the importance of daily time with God's word. We, we have something they didn't have. We have it right here. Printed. What? How do you motivate Christians to love it and to desire it and to spend meaningful, I mean, meaningful time? I think if you, if I, mean, I know there's always some Christians who, who if you look at the, the over, if you, if you look at the greater percentage of their life, they've spent a lot of time listening to sermons and studying the Bible. There's no question. But if you looked at many, if they're honest with you, Monday through Saturday, and for some Christians, I think that they they could spend 20 years and their combined hours of actual in-depth or meaningful Bible study and time in God's word away from church probably would amount to, you know, they would be 20 years of their life would probably amount to less than five hours of meaningful study of God's word at home. Now, some hopefully listen to sermons, that's good, but it, it's your enga- engagement with Scripture. I don't know, but that's that's the number one signpost. I, I posted the podcast from Lifeway, them talking about this. Um, I I I see it as frustration. I our, 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 I our, I don't see it as frustration. I feel frustration and try and just. Well, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? How do we fix it moving forward? How do we fix it moving forward? How do we fix it? I I don't know if there's an easy answer. Um, I, I'm starting to believe that either that some believers are just going to have a hunger for God's word, and I guess some aren't. And I know some out there will say, "Well, if they don't have a hunger for God's word, they're not a believer." You start saying that, you're basically just eliminated. You know, half. You know, ninety percent of Christianity. I I. I, I I don't know what the answer is. And I, I've heard, you know, I've heard it before from, from Christians. I just don't like to read. I just don't like to study. All right, well, I don't know why. You do realize Christianity is a religion where he placed his revelation in written form and he tells us to study it and to read it and to memorize it and to love it and to cherish it and to think about it and to meditate on it day and night. That, that should give you pause that maybe, maybe Christianity isn't for you, okay? I don't know. 
I don't know, something to think about. I just thought I would uh, you know, at least uh, advance the discussion. Not really advancing it. It's kind of frustrating. I don't even want to talk about it, to be honest, because it just makes me so mad. But um, it is something that every Christian has to think about. Look at the state of Christianity. Look at all the studies about uh, Christians and engagement with the Scripture. Look at all the studies about biblical illiteracy. You don't see the problem? Now, okay, how do we fix it? I don't have the answer. You have an answer. Email me at newsif at yahoo.com. And again, I keep saying this in this series. It's going to be the people sitting in the pew who need to speak up. They People in the pew, it's the church members who have to say, okay, wait, here's what you don't understand. And help the pastors understand. Okay, all right, okay, okay, I get you. Okay, now, what can I do? Don't just say, well, you don't understand how busy it is. You gotta say, this is what would help. This is what I need. I mean, I always thought that uh, for our church, I thought the little devotional guide that we used to have, you know, it was, you know, a paragraph long devotional each day. It could be knocked out easy. And all you needed to have is a notebook and write just one thing you learned down from it in one application. I think everyone, everyone could pull every, there's no matter how busy you are, everyone can do that. Everyone can. I, I would show that from the church. I'd say, okay, everyone's too busy. Hear me. Let's time it. And I would time it and go, okay, now let's write one thing down, one application, and we could knock it out 15, 20 minutes. Everyone can pull out 15 or 20 minutes no matter how busy you are. Just, just skip 15 or 20 minutes of sleep. 15, 20 minutes of sleep, if you think that's going to change your whole life, you, you need some counseling. So, but maybe the church, the church, I, the church members' perspective is different than the pastor perspective. The two've got to get together, and church members don't like to speak up about it because I think sometimes if they're honest about their feelings, they know it's going to make them look very unspiritual. But look unspiritual because the pastors need to understand. All right, we'll stop there. All right, everyone, have a great evening. Thank you for listening. I know. I feel like this was a waste of time because I've said all of this before, but we're talking about discipleship and, well, that's what they talked about on the uh, podcast today that I posted. So I thought I would at least throw in my typical, you know, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, I feel like talking to children where the, you know, and you start talking to the teenager and like, oh no, here comes that speech again. And I know it's, oh no, here's his speech again about the Bible, um, you you tell me you tell me how to think differently and I'll be more than happy to change my speech. I'll be more, I'll change it tomorrow. I'll change it tonight, all right? Because I'm tired of the speech, to be honest with you. I'm tired. I just don't know what to say anymore. Every every, every publication that's ever come out about what it means to be a Christian, every discipleship program, everything talks about it doesn't matter. I've got a one-year course on uh, discipleship. Uh, I've got a book called One Year Course in, of Discipleship. It's for a new believer. And what does it start off with? You need daily time in God's Word. You need daily time of God's Word. What do you need to do with God's Word? You need to read it. What do you need to do with God's Word? You need to memorize it. What do you need to do with God's Word? You need to study it. What do you need to do with God's Word? You need to interpret it. What do you need to do with God's Word? You need to apply it. And I'm sitting there looking at the book going, yeah, who does it? <laughs> It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how liberal. If you read Rick Warren's uh, his his book on Bible study methods, a daily quiet time. He's got an entire section on a daily quiet time. You need to spend time in God's Word daily. Liberal churches to conservative churches, everyone says the exact same thing. This is the one thing we have universal agreement on, and I think we have universal agreement from the pulpit. I don't think we have universal agreement from the pew because I think the average church member doesn't actually believe it. I think that they think that's just pastor talk. It's just what pastors are supposed to say. I don't think the people in the pew really believe, man, my spiritual life would probably be better if I would discipline myself to simply spend time in God's word every single day. How do we facilitate that? How do we make that happen? All right. Something to think about. All right, everyone have a great evening. God bless.